All right, guys, Mr. Rofe here, just um, going to do another little drawing thing with you. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about drawing objects and uh, especially things that you can actually see, objects from observation. And I know that makes a lot of people really stressed out because they always wonder whether it's going to look good enough and stuff like that. But we're going to talk a little bit about some things for the pop art project, which um, I know some boys have been um, doing as part of their working from home. And what we're going to look at is just some things that you might have lying around, okay? And we're going to look at some tools, okay? And they can be some really simple things. They don't need to be anything, you know, really complicated. But sometimes, if things have got more detail on them, they're actually easier to draw than if they haven't. And I want to concentrate, I'm just in my shed here, on some really simple tools that I know you will probably have lying about, okay? And what I would like you to do is come up with a range of drawings based on these things. All right. So I'm just looking around my shed now where I am and I'm thinking about some of these interesting shapes I've got of things that I've just got lying around. If you're doing a pop art project, of course, these things are perfect because the pop artists, um, certainly in America in the 1950s and 60s, were trying to make art which was about everyday popular things that's why you see cans of coke that's why you see people like Jim Dine the artist Jim Dine and Andy Warhol making drawings about things like tools uh, packaging labeling anyway so drawing from observation it's really kind of simple you know it is draw what you see time okay so I've got a screwdriver here. I'm going to start with this one and you know lads I don't want you to get too caught up with about making mistakes and about, you know, whether it looks exactly like it. I want to make something really clear. What we're doing here is using this object, this tool, to make a drawing, okay? That's what we're doing. We're using it to make a drawing. And so if the end product doesn't look exactly like it, that's not so bad anyway. We're just using it to make our own drawing. Now, if you're confident enough, you can look at the object that you've got and you can start to follow the shapes. I'm following this round here, just using a pencil. Um, and I'm not too worried about it looking exactly like it, but I am trying to copy these things. Now I've got a camera in the way here, so I'm having to alter and go around things a little bit. But if I make an error, I know that what I'm going to do is just use my rubber to, do, uh, to rub things out. So I'm looking at the top line here, I'm looking at this top shape, and I've got it sitting right close to me, which is really helpful. It's moving a little bit, I understand that. Okay, but just looking at the shapes I've got, then I've got this yellow thing here. Look, I'm just going to draw that in like that. Uh, the way the handle works here is quite interesting. I've got it coming in, this yellow shape, and it comes out and it comes across here. Yeah, and then I'm looking at, I can actually see through there. It's three dimensional. So look, there's a very rough drawing of that screwdriver. Okay, now I've done that really nice and quick. You don't need to. You know, rush these. The more of these you do, the better. If you want to sit down and take uh, a lot longer doing a drawing, there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, really thinking about the shapes and getting it exactly right. That's obviously up to you. You know, I could start to think about adding some tone if I did this again now. And I'm looking at that darker area on the top of the screwdriver. And it's actually got this weird kind of piece of uh, this, this, this flat part part here is all one tone I could start to add tone in to make things look more three-dimensional and add another bit in here and like all art it is about practice isn't it you the longer you spend on these things and the more that you do you'll find that actually you do become better and better at it, okay? So look, yeah, I could start to add some different tones in here. Remember, tone is just light and dark. It's about how I use, it's about how I use the pencil to do different things. Just shutting the door in the shed because it blew open. Um, and I can sort of add darker tones for the shadow under here. I can start to think about putting that in. And then as I get up to where the handle might start, you know, I'm looking at that shape a little bit more closely now. It's a little bit more rounded here. And certainly it comes out into this palm swell like this all right and it's really important that you draw what you can see not what you think it looks like actually that goes up a bit more and then down and in and here and round like that okay so I think mine is a way too wide so I'm gonna bring that back round here yeah but don't be afraid of making errors and just going over it 
because you'll find that then when you start to add the tones you're naturally selecting what you want to keep and what you don't want to keep okay like that anyway that's the screwdriver and that's that's just one thing you can do just by simply looking yeah I'm getting carried away now getting into it right? yeah I can start to put in this I can start to put in this anyway like that that's one thing you can do but some people are not that confident even in going straight into drawing like that so the good thing about tools is the majority of them are quite flat and so there is absolutely nothing wrong either with putting things down and drawing around them so here I've got a paint scraper I'm actually using a biro here now for something a bit different now when you come to give this work in and it's all marked and stuff like that especially if you're doing GCSE work they don't care how you make the images. They don't care if you draw around them. They don't care if you've uh, used printing and you've done rubbings of things or whatever. They don't care. It's just about what you're making. So drawing around an object to get your basic shape right, if that's something that you want to do um, in order to get the shape right, then you can do that. It's not a problem at all, all right? Uh, this one I'm doing in biro. I quite like biro for drawing because it kind of frees you up You don't get so worried about whether you make an error or anything like that You just start to go and you know, I draw quite quickly. I know that um, And I'm banging this in quite quickly and I'm not too worried about the shapes But look already I've got a passable drawing of a paint scraper if I want to use the biro to do some three-dimensional stuff or add a bit of tone I can do that. Yeah, I can use the biro just to add these tones in nice and quick like that anyway you could do that but there are loads of different ways of drawing some people like to do drawings and I know it's something I've done with some of you boys in the classroom as well where you look at an object and you don't actually ever stop moving and you are trying not to take the pen or the pencil off the paper as well so I've got a pair of pliers here and I'm going to draw them in what's called a continuous line so that means I'm not allowed to stop so I'm just keeping going here. I'm trying to look and draw at the same time. It's really tricky, but yeah. And what I will get is a different kind of drawing. It won't be, you know, trying to make it look like it exactly, but I'm using it to make something and that's what I'm after, yeah? So you might look at that and think, oh, what a mess that is. But I can tell you now that if you give that in, it's part of your GCSE and you say that's a continuous line drawing where I didn't take my hand off the paper for 15, 20, 30 seconds, you will find that that will get you marks as well, believe it or not. Because what you've got here is thinking about making a drawing in a different way. And some people would say, some artists certainly would say, that you actually get to know an object much more by drawing what you can kind of see and feel all in the moment rather than sitting down and doing a really long kind of drawing. So this kind of drawing here, even though it might look a bit messy, is certainly going to get you lots of marks as well. That's called continuous line drawing. Okay, um, so one more thing that you could do, and I'm just looking up here to see if I can find something interesting, is I'm going to draw this little brush like this. And what I'm going to think about here is maybe combining some of those techniques. So I'm actually going to draw around it roughly so I get the shape right, like this. Here it is. Okay, so there's a bit of my brush there. Okay, doesn't matter if it comes over to this page, does it? And now I might sit and look at it and I might think, right, well, I might draw some of it from what I can see. Yeah, I'm looking up here at this part here. Looking up here at this part here. There's actually one, one of the bristles is missing there. So look, let's put that in there. That's quite interesting. Like that. And then I might start to think about adding some tone. And this is all just with a pencil here. You know, find out what your pencil can do. And then I've got another bit here. Look, where you can actually see all the bristles coming out. So I might start to put that in there. And I might think about drawing that quite tightly and quite accurately. I'm thinking about what those different bristles might look like and they're all squeezed in there but each one is a small little hair isn't it coming out but there's no way I'm going to sit here and draw well you might but there's no way that today in the shed I'm going to sit here and draw every single one of these all right so then I might think about well okay well maybe that would be enough for that drawing you know I might want to just put the outline in here think about what the different light and dark tones might be as they come around here yeah, or I could go back to my continuous line drawing and think about drawing things in nice and quickly. Yeah, and they've all got this. Look, now I've gone into that continuous line drawing. And you can mix them up. You can mix those styles up. There's nothing to stop me going in here with my pen even on the top of my uh, drawing that I was doing in pencil 
and seeing if I can do that. All right, drawing is a real free thing. Now, I know that there's loads of stuff out there at the moment on Instagram, and I know there's loads of stuff out there all over social media um, showing you lots of different stuff. One thing that I would recommend you have a look at on Instagram is the hashtag isolation art school. Have a go, see what you can find on there. Anyway, there you go, drawing objects. Have a go. Mr. Stennis beat the boredom challenge. Bard and challenge too. Come on! Come on! Come on! Mr. Stenning beat the Bard and challenge three. Stennings beat the Barden Challenge Part 4. guys we're here today um, Mr Roderick here and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some stuff you can be doing in your garden uh, a lot of lads that have been uh, talking to staff and that and parents have been talking to staff about lots of you out there doing little projects in the garden and with the sunshine we've had during this period of isolation it's been a really lovely chance to get out and do a few bits so I know lots of you are digging some stuff up a few of you are talking about growing some food so I want to do today a little bit about how you might be able to help feed your family in the summer by sowing some seed potatoes um, so you can see what I've done here so far is turned over a bit of soil now. If you look slightly to the left down there, you can see where the grass is. That's what it all looked like this morning when I started out. So I've cleared all that off, I've dug it over, uh, and then what I've done is dug a trench about 10 to 15 centimetres deep. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about putting your seed potatoes in the ground, okay? Um, so what I've got here is some nice seed potatoes, okay? So this is actually a variety called Rocket, and you can see just on the top there it's got a little sprout. We call that the eye. And that's started to shoot up now and that's going to grow into a plant okay and this seed potato here it's an old rotten old manky old if you squeeze it it's a bit soft manky old spud that's going to go in the ground now and then produce some more for us to eat later on in the summertime okay so what i'm going to do with these is i'm going to put them down in the ground and i want them about 30 centimeters apart so i've cut myself a little stick so i'll put down somewhere random and it's about 30 centimeters this stick Perhaps a little bit longer, but that'll do the job. It's going to give me a, a rough measurement of where these spuds need to go. Okay, so I'm just going to put them down in. And I want the eye pointing up to the sky, so eye to the sky always. You can see that where that is, nice and clear. Now I was lucky, I managed to get out of these before everything started to shut down um, from an online store. I'm not sure there's an awful lot of online seed potatoes around now, uh, but certainly you can have a look around on places like Thompson, maybe King's Seeds. Uh, even eBay and failing that if that don't work get in the back of your fridge have a look see what's hanging around in there if you've got a couple of old spuds that are starting to look a bit soft it's starting to sprout like that or even with the white sprouts it's not ideal but they could go in the ground and you could try and grow in a crop they would advise that you try and buy proper seed potatoes always and I would do the same but if you can't get them in this in climate it can be difficult then use what you got you know if you've got old seed potatoes sitting around just manky old things Stick them in the ground, see what happens. You've got nothing to lose. You've got plenty of time on your hands. 
Now I've got a bit of a problem here because I've got a bit of a, a tree root and I wasn't planning to dig that out. So I'm going to work around that. What I might do is space that one back a little bit. Put that one down in there. It's not ideal, but again, we're doing best with what we got. If I can grow three potatoes for later on in the year, that's going to go really well, okay? Now this variety will be ready in about 110 days or so. It's so about four months. So we're looking at now early April. So by the time August starts, they should be more or less ready to go. And we'll know when they're ready because they'll start to flower. Now what they will need is lots of water. So if you're sensible, you've got these somewhere near to a nice water supply in your garden, somewhere you can get a watering can, but it's still a hose pipe too. Okay. And that'll do the job. And then all I'm going to do is cover those back over with the soil that I dug out earlier. Okay. Now you don't have to do it in a line if you've got space and you can do it in a little square, you can do it like that. You can see that mine is right on the edge of a flower border here. Literally taking advantage of a little bit of space on the edge of a flower border. I might another time maybe put some flowers in here, but this year a few extra potatoes won't go any harm. So that covered over now. Just these last few down this end. And those of you who've been doing horticulture with me, remember your tool technique, thumb always pointing up towards the handle, save your back, means you can do this for a bit longer. You won't feel quite so much pain. I know younger fellas probably don't need to worry about that so much, but it will save you later on. cane stick it in the end so I know roughly where that is if you've got younger kids in the family might put a little ball on the end there stop anyone poking their eyes out and then what I will do is just give that a little wake over make it look tidy when we finish off go. Now the last job, potatoes are really thirsty, they don't mind a bit of competition, they don't mind being in this new soil, in fact they're a good crop for this new soil because they're really tough and they're hardy and they'll force their way through everything but what they do need is lots and lots of water if you're planning on getting any kind of a crop. So you can see there's one watering can full there, just gone on about three or four spuds so I'll go and get some more in a minute and finish that job off. We're at my shed again and uh, just want to continue on with some of the stuff we've been talking about with regards to carving. So we're going to look at carving a little spoon today. I'm not going to do too much talking on this one, just going to show you how to do it. So um, where I live, I'm lucky enough, lucky enough to be able to go and get some uh, fresh timber outside. So this is a piece of hazel here and I've cut that to maybe about, I don't know, maybe 12, 15 centimetres, 12 centimetres. And that's a piece of willow. These are both um, really good starting timbers to carve with because they uh, are nice and easy to carve while they're green um, and that means that the wood has been freshly cut if all you can get is a manky old bit of pallet like this you can still draw uh, your shape of your spoon out on there you know and you will still be able to carve that you might want to cut it out first um, using a saw or something like that but that's still perfectly feasible. But for those of you who've got access to go and get something, I thought I'd just show you here. So, like I say, um, in the last video we talked about tools. I'm just going to use um, maybe these three, maybe even just these two tools today um, and show you a few techniques. Obviously, as I said in the first video, this isn't a, this is a video for people who've done some carving before and might want to carry on at home. Um, it's not really for people who have never done it before, you know, because um, obviously with knives and things like that you've got to be really careful about what you're doing and um, I know that some of you have been carving at home so here's just a little refresher on um, 
carving a little spoon or something, all right? So the first thing I'm gonna do, and don't need a big ax or anything like that, is I'm gonna try and split this piece down so that I've got uh, the middle section. It's gonna be quite a small spoon, obviously, um, and I'm gonna use this mallet for that. I'm using the willow here, because I know that it's um, really soft. I've literally just been out and cut it in a field that I've got access to, to cut. And then remembering all of the safety stuff we've talked about um, for the majority of cuts where you know we're holding our knife in a good strong grip and we're carving away from us like this okay so um, the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of all of the green bark because if I keep that on the likelihood is that that won't stay on and even that might be a bit too thick so I'm gonna pare that down a bit more like I say, this is going to be a nice quick video. Bat that's called battening that technique, as I'm sure some of you know. And it's a very effective way of um, paring your, the, the wood down to the size that you want. And what I'm looking for now is a bit of a flat top. You can see that that's a bit skew, so I need to take a bit off of that corner there. And I keep lo I'm looking down here to see if I can uh, get that as flat as I can, because it just makes drawing out and marking out so much easier okay using these strong cuts now you will find and I know that a lot of you have done this with me before but the wood will carve better one way than the other as I turn that round there the wood was really biting and tearing out you can see this tear out and that's because the wood fibers are actually running this way so by turning it over I can take off much better shavings now I could feel that with this um, bit of timber I've got in my hand or this bit of wood it's actually really wet and that's what we call about being green and willow is very easy to carve because when it's green it's got a lot of moisture in it and that means that the knife will glide there's a bit of lubrication there for it to glide across so your cuts are a lot easier sometimes you have to go that way i've got a bit of a knot now I think. so as you can see what i'm actually trying to do here is just bring this down to make a stock yeah what we would call a stock um not too thick nearly the thickness of my little finger keep taking those bits off you could do all of this with um, by battening, but it's nicer to get that down. And when I get down to something roughly about this dimension, that's when I might think about drawing something on it. Now, I always draw on mine because I just think it makes life a bit easier, but you don't have to do that. This is going to be a very small spoon. You can see that this little one I've got here, even already, is a bit bigger than that one. But I will use it anyway as a little template um, for drawing on and I'm going to maybe move him up looking for the widest bit yeah I will do it that way and just by using a pencil you could just get a spoon out your cutlery drawer you don't have to make spoons um, certainly the best place to start when you're making anything doing any carving work is by thinking about um, little tent pegs and stuff like that so you look you can see now that I'm having to add that little bit in a bit okay like that so we've got a shape that looks a bit like this okay and then very simply now i'm going to start to turn these off now i use lots of different cuts normally but because of the angle of the camera i'm going to try and um, do most of the work using this forehand grip um, so apologies if i wander off the camera sometimes because i know that sometimes i like to use that chest grip that i've spoke to you guys about before you know this is the reinforced thumb grip putting my thumb on the back of the blade Look, you can see this here and then pushing forward much more control this way you can take off some nice big chunks with that okay just going to bring this light around i think it might help if it was there um yeah and then turning around always thinking about where the knife will travel you know i'm following this line here so i've got to be mindful of this part of my finger here making sure that's behind the blade i've got my thumb on the back using that reinforced thumb cut, pushing and turning away like that. That's how I always talk about it. Turning away, okay? Just like this. Nice and easy. Keep turning that up and away. And we're getting down to a spot now where we've nearly got that very rough shape that we're looking for. Just even up over here. Yeah, we're gonna carry on at the back here. Carving out, carving away, chipping out those little bits on the back. 
until we're getting something that looks starting to look a little bit spoon like i've got a bit more here i can use this carving technique as well now what i'm going to try and do now is i'm going to try and even up these two sides and i might do that with a pencil first and i can see i need to take a little section out of there just to make it um, even on both sides you don't have to make your spoon even on both sides nobody says that one of the very first spoons I ever carved was out of a bit of holly <laughs> and it's really odd shape but I really like it I use it quite a lot it had a little twig growing out there and uh, I incorporated that because I actually felt that that looked quite cool yeah so you know your spoon can be whatever shape you want really um, you don't have to make it um, equal on both sides so just looking at this technique now and then I'm going to turn it over I'm going to make the handle a bit thinner now yeah and I can use those long strokes for that doesn't take too long a very powerful stroke that one you get a lot of wood off in a lot in quite a quick go so look now we've got this sort of basic shape that we're looking at here now because this wood is green and that I've cut it and also because it's willow it's quite stringy um, you know this 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 timber here is not gonna make a beautiful finish unless you let it dry out and then once it's dried out you can sand it to some extent but um, really it's gonna be much more of a kind of a rough spoon now I'm using a different grip here where I'm using my actual body here and I'm just doing these little pairing cuts towards us. I've spoke about this in the classroom and about how careful you have to be. And by bringing your hands very close, you know that you're not going to go into yourself. Just trying to get some of that off like that. So now we're getting to this kind of space and it's getting quite thin there. I really want to be carving this way. Um, so I'm going to do some of these pairing cuts here. Let's see if I can lean in a bit and see that a bit better. Like this, I'm trying to take off the top there so it's nice and round on the end. And then these, this you can see the tear out here. That's because of the grain direction. So I am going to try and just take off a couple of clean cuts like this, coming this way where I know the grain is going, so I can get rid of those. Now I've hit what's called the pith line there, and I have to make a decision. Now I can try and carve through that, knowing that it might make my handle quite thin, or I can leave it there as a feature of it. Um, it will be a slight weak spot um, I think for today I'm gonna leave that there okay so I've still got some more here I want to take off the back and like I say green wood if you can get it is much easier to carve than dead dry wood but it doesn't have to be, and I'm going to take that off now, look, I made a decision there, I've committed. Um, it doesn't have to be anything too extravagant. You can use a bit of a tree from in your garden, or it doesn't even have to be a tree. It can be, you know, a bit of hedge, if you can find a thick enough bit of hedge, and if people at home are all right with you doing that, that'll make a perfectly adequate little spoon. And it's really just about keeping your skills in, you know. I'm getting very thin now in here, so I don't want to go too much more than that. So I'm just going to use this real gentle technique here and sometimes in these little spoons you learn so many different little skills because it doesn't really matter too much yeah you obviously want to make something which is nice but if it goes wrong it doesn't matter you can just start over and make a new one so here we go again looking at this technique sorry I'll come back down there that's my dog going nuts sorry about that so I'm gonna let him in in a minute I'm gonna take this right back down and then we're gonna talk a little bit about that last um, that last tool that we use now you can see I've got quite a high spot at the back there just there and bring it down a bit uh, I've got quite a high spot there um, so I might want to try and just take a tiny bit off of that if I can like this I'm trying to keep it down low so the lights better I know the lights better down there okay like that now we've got all these facets on the back and if you just use your knife and you just keep going across 
you can get that down to quite smooth but i really like those i put those on a lot of the spoons that i make i've got these facets on but um but you know when you look at a more finished one you can still see it's quite irregular quite like that uh, but if you want to wait until it's dry and then sand it down till it goes super smooth like some of these that's fine too right let's talk about this last knife so We've got to a stage now where I want to start thinking about taking out this part in the middle of the bowl and you do need to use what's called a spoon or a hook knife for that. Uh, this is a, These are quite dangerous tools but if you use them in the right way um, and in a safe way, um, you know, always thinking about where you're cutting, um, you'll be okay. There's two different types. Here I've got a right-handed one and then here's the left-handed one and you can see the blades on the other side. So some people like to use it to scoop it this way. So you hold it really tight in one hand, making sure this hand isn't going to get cut, and then you put this in and you chip out like this. Now you can do it that way, that's fine, but I've always found it easier to carve away from me. So think about when you're on a motorbike or something and you're and you're you know pulling that throttle round. I always think about that kind of motion and holding the spoon as close as I can. I want to try and go across the grain here, look, and turn it up. And I've always found for me that's the easiest way to take the inside out because what I'm actually doing is carving away from me so I've got more control and also I can use this hand as well I can sort of do this this kind of a motion here all right so look now this is willow so this is carving really easy but this is a real practicing there's nothing wrong with getting a bit of timber like this like this and just practicing those cuts you know, you can see that in this wood, it still does the same. As long as your knife sharp, and we'll talk about that in another, in another video. As long as your knife sharp, you can still do that. And this is just a bit of dry pallet, literally. You know, some people, when they make spoons, do this bit first. So they actually carve the little gouge out, or the little bowl bit, sorry, like that. And then they draw the spoon on, and then they make it from there. You know, there's nothing to stop you doing that. If you wanted to have a go at doing that, you could literally start your spoon that way, I can't find my pencil now, um, you could literally start the spoon that way and then um, and then draw around it, draw around the bowl that you've made again and then you've already done the hard bit in a way, uh, you could go like that, draw it in like that, anyway back to our one, so here we go, <clears throat> just keep it nice and low, um, there might come a time then when you've gone kind of round one side and you might need to turn it around. Just be really careful about where these fingers are. I know there's some lads out there who've <laughs> who have had a few little injuries cutting themselves doing the spoon bit. Um, but if you're w worried about that or if you haven't got a spoon knife then don't worry about it and wait and um, just leave your spoon blanks without that bit and we can do those when we get back. Okay, whenever that is. So now I'm going around, evening up. This part here, I've got. I want to take this bit off. Got a big lump here. Look. And um, yeah, this is certainly how I would learn by just using whatever wood I've got available to make some very simple little spoons. Hope you can see what I'm doing there, paring this back bit down. That's way too fat, too chunky. And I can get most of that down by doing that. Try not to go too thin. Try not to go too thin. And then I've got this last fine cut here to really bring that back to where I wanted it to be. I think carving's a real if you're safe and you know what you're doing. I think it's a great thing to pass some time, but also to keep your skills going. It's quite calming, I've always found. I think some of you boys know that though. And anyway, let's try and get that bit off. Now, you could then move on, if your wood was dry enough, to using a bit of sandpaper to rub things down and get a nice finish. All right, but Today, um, just going to tidy this up here. Today, what we're looking at is more just getting something quite simple as a start. All right, so have a go at that. And next time, we'll talk a little bit maybe about 
you know if I leave this now and then let it dry we'll talk about how we could finish it with some sand and some oil um, but I'll put a few more videos up as we go uh, over the next couple of weeks now I've worked out how to film it right and um, hopefully we can share some more stuff on on carving a little spoon there you go bye now